let's get started. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, spending the hour uh, or 15 minutes with me uh, in this session. I really appreciate it. My name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I like to bring some of the latest and greatest technology and practices uh, that we learn from Google uh, and bring it to the developers all over the world. And the other side of it is that I love to learn about how you're using technology today. And uh, if you're using Google Cloud, love to learn about what you're doing. If not, love to learn about the other tools that you use today. So the best way to contact me is on Twitter at Satanism. Okay. Aside from technology, I love, I love to travel. I love to take photographs uh, wherever I go. You can find my photos on my Flickr as well. Uh, this photo is a little special to me. It's, uh, it's when I was backpacking in Asia. I was uh, in the city where I couldn't really find a cheap place to stay because as a backpacker, I, you know, I, I, I needed to find a cheap place so I can spend a night or two. And uh, this specific city in China didn't let me do that. So what happened then is somebody, a random backpacker, told me, you can actually go into the desert and uh, hike for four hours towards the southwest direction. And there you actually find an oasis and you can stay there for free. And I heard, free? Let's go. And I didn't think twice. How many people here hike in the desert before? Anyone? Oh, there's always one or two people. Yeah, there you go. By yourself? Yeah, maybe. But, but you walk on the beach, no? Everybody walk on the beach? It's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> uh, basically, um, the, the sand is really soft, right? So every step that you take, you sink a little bit. And you have to pull yourself out. And when somebody tells you you have to walk in one direction for four hours, it doesn't matter what's in front of you, you just go. So there are all these sand dunes, you have to go up and down, and you sink, you, you put yourself back up. Um, during that time in my mind, I was kind of thinking, wow, this feels like writing a J2EE application. And, uh, <laughs> but the end was beautiful, right? Like, for developers, uh, what is the most exciting thing is getting to the end. And the, the road to the end could be a little tough. And my job is really just to make sure that your journey is um, a little easier, I hope, uh, by going through this session. And what I'm going to talk about today is not another microservices talk, but you probably heard about it already. Uh, how many people here are already uh, implementing microservices? Yeah, quite a few of you. Okay, very cool. So yeah, so there's no theory here. I'm not going to tell you whether to do or not. Uh, you know, all of those things you have to decide for yourself. You just remember you do it to to solve a problem, you don't want to do it just for doing it, right? So there's no theory here. I'm just going to tell you how this new platform can help you solve problems. When we break down a monolith into microservices, or if you are starting off with a microservice architecture, well, first of all, the first problem you're going to see is you're going to get more and more components that you have to manage, right? Rather than just one single application code base and one thing you need to deploy, now you have to deploy many, many different components and they all have to work together. And you don't just run one instance of each, you run many, many instances of them. And this problem becomes a little bit more complicated, but luckily we actually have tools that helps you to do this at scale. So with so many instances, you have to figure out how you can deploy them onto a cluster of machines. Uh, if you are having a big project, you don't want to SSH in, into each individual machines and do this manually. I've seen people doing it, and it's not good. What you need is some kind of orchestration tool to help you to do that. And we have those tools today with containerization, with Kubernetes. We can actually take care of some of these deployment level problems. So you can deploy very easily. You can beam pack. You can run multiple applications on the same machines. And we will take care of restarting the apps for you and even the networking model behind the scenes, right? Those are solved problems. So with Kubernetes, right, we can actually just say, well, here is the application I want to run. I just give it a container image, and I can just say how many instances I want. And basically, we push the container image to like a registry. The config file, we can send it to the Kubernetes master node, where it can control a bunch of you know, machines behind the scenes. They're just aggregated resource in this case. Each machine may have different resource, but Kubernetes can actually figure out which machine has the proper amount of the resource to actually run your application. So rather than doing this manually, the scheduler within will be able to orchestrate the, the, the deployment process for you, right? So it will say, oh, do you have enough capacity? No, All right, let me try another machine. If the machine has, it's going to download the Docker container for you from the registry and start the application, right? This is a thing that we can do today. And if you want to learn more about Kubernetes, I'd be happy to you know, chat afterwards as well. 
But the key here with Kubernetes, to me, is that it offers this concept of a control plane. What that means is, through the control plane, through the utility, or through the API call, I can tell Kubernetes, I can tell my cluster what is the desired state I want to be, what is the application architecture that should be. And behind the scenes, somebody else wakes up and say, I need to make the real, you know, the, the, the physical world the same as what you are wanting in your YAML files or in your definitions. So it actually has a well-defined API and set of types that you can just use, and it actually abstracts away the underlying infrastructure for you. But most importantly, it also allows me to see all of the machines, not as individual machines, but as an aggregated resource that we can utilize. And the way we can do this is by using the control plan. So I'm just going to show you a little um, demo of this, and just so you can see what's going on. Right? So behind the scenes, I have uh, quite a few of these YAML files that I already created. This is a uh, multi-tier application with microservices behind the scenes. And if I open up oh, one of these things, uh, deployment v1, for example, if I scroll down, I can see which Docker image I'm trying to run. And I actually deployed everything already onto this Kubernetes cluster, which has four nodes. And I can see there's the front end, and there's the MySQL deploy into it. Uh, we can scale each part indiv uh, individually if we want to. And we can also see the ingress, which is the way for us to see this application. Right? This is a HTTP load balancer that we can provision directly in Kubernetes, and we should be able to see the app. And I used this app before, so if you've seen it before, uh, don't worry, there's something new to it, right? So I'm gonna say hello DevOps, and hopefully this request is going, gonna go through, and you can see the, the response here, and we also store data in the database, right? And you can do this with just one command line, we can deploy this whole application architecture in a matter of seconds onto multiple machines. However, one of the problems that we don't usually ask is how are these services supposed to communicate with each other, okay? And I do mention this in some of my other talks, especially with the different protocols that you can use. There are actually two facets to it. One is the protocol, the communication channel you can use. So whether it's TCP or something higher level with HTTP or HTTP2, or what type of payload you can actually send. But the other side of it with the communication is the fact that you have separated everything away now, rather than making these calls in memory or in process, all of these calls are now going over network. And with network, you have more latency. And also, potentially, it's more unreliable. And because of this, as soon as you move into this kind of architecture, what you're going to see is potentially latency problems, right? Or reliability problems. Uh, how do you make sure that you're connecting to the instance that's actually up and running? You have to be very careful. And so to have a full microservices architecture, it's beyond just being able to run your app. It's beyond just being able to deploy and manage them at scale. But there are a lot of the non-functional requirements that you may actually have to add to this entire architecture. You have to ask about how, what's the best way for me to load balance my requests uh, to the back end. Uh, if the network is unreliable, how do you tolerate that? How do you deal with those failures? How do you actually add tools and maybe logging and tracing so that you can have insight into what's happening in your service architecture? And with the Java world, we have many of the open source tools that can help us solve these issues. Right? With Netflix OSS, we have the service registry with Eureka. Your backend can register with the registry, and now everybody can discover what the endpoints are. You can use a client silo balancer if you want to. Uh, in this case, you know you trust the client, so the client has the control over which server to connect to and how they want to con connect to it, but that's controlled by the client side. Now, what if you don't trust the client? If you don't trust the client, then you have to control these connections on the server side load balancer with a proxy. And with a the proxy, then you have other issues, like you have to make an extra hub, you may have to maintain more infrastructure and all that. So you have to decide how you're going to load balance your application. And then we have other tooling like Hystrix and other things that help you to deal with faults in the network. And then you have tools like Zipkin and Prometheus and Grafana that allows you to have insight. So what happens with the microservice architecture is that we build a lot more things 
outside the microservices, right? This is kind of like those problems where we thought we we're solving a problem, but now we just have potentially more problems to solve, right? Every one of these boxes could be a problem for you. And you gotta make them HA, highly available. And the services themselves, now you gotta run all of these client-side components to make it work, to make it reliable. So rather than building a microservice, potentially we could be looking at a microservice, a much bigger service because of all of these dependencies that you add to the consumer side. Okay. So it is really easy to do this. I cannot deny it. It's very, very easy to do it, especially if you have a single stack that you're working with, especially if you're using Spring Boot, which I love very much. And you can do this very quickly with a few lines of dependencies, and you can get this entire thing up and running in development. But then you also have to manage it afterward as well, right? But this is fairly easily done in Spring Boot. If you go to any of the Spring sessions, you'll probably see how this is done. However, it gets a lot harder and more difficult if you actually have multiple stacks, right? What if you don't always use Spring Boot? What if you found another thing that you want to use, but now you have to go back and think about, OK, how do I do all of those things again? How do I integrate all of these capabilities into this new platform. If you have different frameworks, you got to deal with that as well. If it's JEE or Spark or you know, like some other new frameworks that you want to try, now you have to go back and deal with these issues as well. Because even worse, if you're doing polyglot with different languages in your company or in your organization, do they all have to do the same thing? Now you're looking at you know, a very big problem to bring all the services up to par especially legacy applications, right? Um, something that works in an application server and it's been running for a long time. How do you deal with that? Right? How do you migrate these applications uh, without causing so much trouble? At the end of the day, when we talk about service-to-service -service communication, I want to boil it down to just one thing. Let my service talk to your service. How does A talk to B? Right? All of these other things shouldn't be um, uh, something that you need to concern about in terms of how do I do that in my program, right? The communication should just be provided by the platform. Same thing with some of these non-functional requirements should also be provided by the platform. It should be as simple as making an HTTP request from A to B okay, to make that service call uh, without anything else, right? Just make that call and the platform should be able to provide the resiliency that you need for your architecture. And this is where Istio, the service mesh, enters. Right. Service mesh is a pretty new term, and, um, and that's what I'm going to you know, spend most of my time talking about. It is a way for you to manage the service communication. Just like Kubernetes, Kubernetes was designed for you to orchestrate containers and run containers at scale across multiple uh, machines. A service mesh is designed to be the fabric that will handle your service communication. So now you have the half of the story of deployment. With Istio, you have the other half about networking, re, re, uh, service communication, and resiliency. Okay? It was actually uh, worked on together and open source together by uh, Google and IBM and Lyft. We use components from uh, these uh, different um, uh, companies as well. And it was designed to be multi-platform. What that means is you should be able to run this service mesh in different underlying infrastructure or platform. So for example, if you're using Kubernetes, we have support for Kubernetes. So you can lay on top of Kubernetes this service mesh. And well, I'll show you what that looks like. And you don't have to deal with some of these uh, non-functional requirements explicitly in your app anymore. Okay? But the same idea can also be applied to a VM-based or bare metal uh, infrastructure as well. Okay? So what is it? What does it do? Uh, in my mind, this is what the service mesh needs to do, right? First of all, it is there to take care of the service-to-service -service communication. When you open a connection from A to B, uh, how is that going to be happening? And how do you handle potentially the networking problems that you're going to see? It should also be able to provide you insight into the performance of your services and be able to give you insight into how all of these service calls are happening. Again, we do these today, but we do these in our client-side applications, right? We do this in the callers. But this is going to be provided by the service mesh. 
It should also be able to handle failures. So being able to retry your request automatically without your application explicitly asking for it, right? Or uh, circuit breaking as well. So what that means is a lot of these components that we add today into your microservice in a Java application potentially might go away because the platform can handle it. Okay. And all of these other things that surrounds the microservice arch architecture can potentially also kind of fade away so that what you're, left, what you're left with is just the service, right? Just your business logic and your code. And what we're going to be able to do in a service mesh is actually take all of these cross-cutting cross concerns and move that into a proxy, okay? And so when we're running your microservice, rather than just running the service itself, we're also going to run a proxy alongside of it. And this is known as a sidecar pattern. What that means is we're externalizing some common functionalities uh, so that your application don't have to deal with it, but we will be able to perform all of these cross-cutting concerns through a common uh, component, which is the proxy itself. And the proxy that we're using is the Envoy proxy. This is a proxy uh, created by Lyft, and it's it's high-performance proxy. It's uh, apparently pretty awesome at this job, right? It was battle-tested uh, within Lyft as well, serving two million requests per second, you know, in their data centers and all that. But the important thing to me is that it also has a low memory footprint, right? So we're externalizing some of these functionalities. Uh, you don't want to, you know, double the amount of footprint that you need to to run it. You, you want to, you know, have it a little bit more, more manageable, right? So Envoy is the proxy of choice, but you can also use other proxies as well. But through the proxy, uh, it actually offers a lot of these uh, cross cutting uh, requirements and just solves them for you automatically, right? So load balancing, TLS communication, HTTP2, traffic splitting, health checks, fault injection, all that, that's all provided by, by the proxy directly. But how does the proxy, how is this different from, say, if you were just to run your own server-side load balancer, right? That's a, that's a very uh, valid question. From the client-side load balancing side, your client pick and chooses how they want to load balance, right? The client load balancer needs to pick and choose from a list of endpoints and say which one to go to. From a proxy perspective, the proxy decides, or the server-side load balancer decides how you're going to do that. The difference here is that we run, we can run a proxy per microservice instance. What that means is if you have multiple micro, you know, A services and B services, every one of those instances will be proxied. Okay? And these proxies are configured automatically through a control plan. So you can actually, just like Kubernetes, I can write a YAML file to define how my applica application architecture should look like. With Istio, you can write a policy file, and that will define what your service communication policy should be, and it will be sent to the pilot, Istio pilot component, and from there, it can actually automatically configure all of the proxies in your environment to enforce these rules, okay? So the way that this works behind the scenes is like this. So every service I deploy, it automatically adds a proxy for you. And when service A makes a call to service B, it's just an HTTP call. Okay, you say HTTP, get, and that's as transparent as it can be. Behind the scenes, we are using IP table rules to intercept this connection, intercept this request, and we'll forward this request to the proxy associated to that specific instance. So this communication is local. And from there, the proxy has a list of destinations that is associated with service B because it can actually get it from Kubernetes automatically. It's automatically synchronized and configured. And through the proxy, through the destination policies, it can figure out what way should I low balance this call, what other policies and enforcement should I have, and then it's going to pick and choose one of the instances to 402. And it not only intercepts the outbound, it also intercepts the inbound. So your application cannot actually call anything unless it goes to the proxy because we intercept everything through this proxy, okay? What that also means is potentially your firewall rules uh, may not be, you know, in some cases may not be necessary because this is already firewall off by the IP table rules. So once the request gets to the proxy on the target, then it checks the policies and then enforce to the target instance. And on the way back, right, it goes through the same routes and goes all the way back to the caller. Now, because 
Now you see, all the information flow is through this one component. But we have many, many instances of it, right? So it's not a single bottleneck. It's not a single instance. It's not a single bottleneck. This is just attached to your uh, service. Because everything is going through this path, we can enforce and apply the cross-cutting concerns, just like an interceptor in Java, right? We can intercept all of these things and say, OK, if I need to monitor the latency, well, I know when the request came in. I know when the request got responded. I know when it finished. Now I have latency information. I can send this off to uh, my, my um, Prometheus, for example. I can send it to metric store. If I need to know, um, you know who calls what, well, everything goes to the proxy. So now I can, if, if I do pass in the trace ID, these, the proxy component can forward all the data for me to Zipkin. So I don't need to run Zipkin in my own application anymore either. Right? It will just be done through these components. If I want to uh, tr you know, split the traffic, well, all I need to do is to configure it decora uh, decoratively, and then the configuration gets applied to the proxy component, and now the proxy knows how much percentage of traffic to migrate to what. Right? This is pretty simple and straightforward now. And lastly, the most importantly about security, uh, the communication between service instance and the proxy could be plain text, but that's because they're local. They're contained within its own uh, environment. However, if you need to go and call another service across the network, you might want to make it secure uh, because maybe you're running an environment where you need extra security, right? You don't want it to go over plain text. Rather than doing this in your own services, you can now rely on the proxy to establish mutual TLS. With Istio, we can actually install a certificate authority that can automatically issue certificates for your TLS that identifies itself. What that means is you can also trust these certificates so that you can safely say, you know, putting the enforcement off, A can only talk to B, but not, a, not anybody else, because we can enforce this not only through the IP table rules, but also through the use of certificates. So with all that said, everything kind of ties together. So your application will just become simple. All those latency information, tracing information, all those, they can be forwarded to the mixer. This is another component within Istio. And through the mixer, we can propagate the, the trace information, latency information to the platform services. So in this case, we can still use Zipkin, we can still use Prometheus. But if you're running on the cloud platform, this is a plugin model, so you can plug in different adapters that forwards it to different clouds. So in this case, I can actually use the mixer, potentially, that will forward not to my own Zipkin instances, because then I have to manage it, I can forward all the data to Google Cloud with our Stardriver Trace, for example. That's a hosted solution that you can store um, a lot more data. You don't have to manage it. Right. So what that also means is when you're dealing with deployments, uh, Kubernetes abstracts everything away. We're dealing with cross-functional cutting concerns. Istio takes your, you know, abstracts everything away. All right. So with the rest of the time, I'm just going to show you a little demo. And I think I have uh, about 30 minutes left. So let's see how this works. Now, at the beginning, I said, this is great if you're using a polyglot or if you're using different frameworks. So for this talk, I'm not going to use Spring Boot, even though I love it. But um, you know, I, can, I can certainly use Spring Boot. Uh, I can also use something lighter weight, like uh, Spark Java, or, um, or something legacy, like uh, Application Server. And uh, I, I thought about this, and I said, what is the smallest microservice I can write? Okay. To, to prove this point, right? That we can actually help you with all of these things. So, so I decided to use something that nobody else ever uses. And uh, that happened to be the uh, Sun HTTP server. Has anyone used that before? Yeah, that's what I thought. There's like one or two people, <laughs> right? So I'm going to create a client, uh, two services, one close to each other, uh, purely by just the JDK methods, right? So. I don't know if anyone's seen this before, but I'm going to take this on right now. So I'm going to you know, create a new client, a new HTTP client. right? I'm going to assign this to a variable here with the HTTP client. And uh, I need to give it the new uh, socket address. I'm going to listen on, in this case, uh, port 8081. And I'm going to set this thing. Oh, yeah, this is uh, Java 9. Sorry. Also, nobody used it. <laughs> so I'm going to add this module. right? And now I have the server that's just listening on a port. And then what I can do is um, I need to set the executor so that this can be multi-threaded. So I can set the, um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, not the client. Sorry, I'm, I'm, what am I using? I'm, I should be using an HTTP server in this case, right? So I need to create, there you go, 
I, uh, there you go, and 81 and 0. So that should give me the server. And uh, again, Java 8, uh, Java 9 modules, I need to do that. And I can just use the variable code server. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of the client. All right. And also uh, get rid of this line as well. All right. And with the server, uh, now I have established it. I can set the ex executor, right? So I can give it the uh, one of these uh, thread pools that I can use. So I'm going to say executor is that. Oh, which one? The cache thread pool. That someone that one sounds good. And I'm going to start it. Okay. And then I'm going to um, just add a little handler that will do something. So, so the, the, this demo will, uh, will have two different services. One of them is the work service, and the other one is, well, what is work? Work is just composed of, um, you know, tons of meetings. So the other service is just meetings, okay? So in this service, I'm just going to um, have a handler that takes in meetings. So I'm going to use some path called meet, and um, it's going to give me an exchange. And from here, I can take the response. And what is a meeting? A meeting is really just a time that you spend uh, without any uh, doing any work, basically. So, so I'm gonna just sleep for 250 milliseconds because that's what we do in meetings, right? We just like don't do anything and not, nothing productive from this microservice in this case. Okay, and then um, and I just need to respond. So I'm going to say exchange that send my response header, and uh, oh sorry, not the response header. Uh, exchange that set. The, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it is a response header. So 200 and uh, zero bytes because I, I didn't produce anything from this meeting. And I'm going to get the uh, response body. I'm going to close it, okay? And that's it. That's a microservice, everyone, right? How, how micro is this microservice? Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'll just show you how micro this microservice is. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and build it, okay? So, oh, not that one, this one. I'm going to do a Maven clean and package. So this is uh, brand new, uh, very uh, dangerous thing for me to do as well. So we'll see how this works. By the way, as I'm building the service, I'm also building the, the Docker image over the, the, the network here and also push the image out. So all of these things are done and configured through the pom.xml. Uh, just to show you how small this service is, <laughs> it is, uh, oh, there we go, three kilobytes, yeah? And this actually runs. This uh, if I do Java jar uh, target and the meeting service in jar, it should yeah, it actually I think it's running. Yeah, <laughs> you never know until you try it, right? So here we go. I'm going to go to localhost uh, eighty eighty one and uh, meet. Yeah, yeah, it works. Two hundred fifty milliseconds. I can kind of feel it, right? So that's good. <laughs> Not bad. Huh? It's working. Trust me. All right. So then I can implement the worker service, right? So this I already implemented a few things. I'm gonna pull this up a little bit. And um, not, not literally, but like the font. And I'm going to, I have this handler for work. So what did I say about work? It just uh, tons of uh, meaningless meetings. So I'm gonna do a for loop, right? I'm gonna say i's, uh, da, 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 i's less than four and i plus plus, right? So I, now I need to make a call out. Now I'm not in Spring Boot, so I don't get the nice REST template. I'm not in Spark, I'm not in anything. In fact, I don't have any external dependency. So then I thought maybe I can use um, something that also nobody ever uses, uh, HTTP client from JDK9, okay? So I can create a new client, right? I can say uh, a new HTTP client. Let me move it up here. That uh, uh, new HTTP client, right? Anyone use this new thing already? No, yeah, that's why I thought nobody uses it, <laughs> right? So I can assign this to uh, a little variable here. And of course, Java 9, Need to add this module, okay? And then you can actually build the request. So this is again very straightforward. I'm going to do a HTTP request. I'm going to do a new builder. You can create a new RI, and I'm going to use the endpoint here. Uh, and uh, this is pretty ugly, actually. Uh, you need to specify what method you want to use. So I'm going to just use a get method, and that's going to return me a builder, uh, which I need to use later. So I'm going to keep it here. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to say. Uh, what is this? HTTP request dot builder. Uh, builder is equal to that one. Okay, and then from the builder, I can say uh, build, for example, and that's going to give me the request. Okay, and that's the request. And so for me to make this request, I can just use the HTTP client to say HTTP client dot send the request, and then I need to get the response. By the way, uh, this is all you know pretty new to me as well. But apparently, you need to use like a handler. I can then turn everything into a string, uh, and then what you get back is just a string that you can consume. So 
let me see here. There we go. There's the response string. Okay. And then once you have the response, you can actually check the, the status code. So in this case, one, whoa, whoa, undo, undo. There we go. <laughs> what you can actually do is if the response was successful, then I'm going to say meeting plus plus, right? I just want to uh, count how many meetings I have, kind of. Did I meetings? Yeah, plural here, OK? And if the response code is not 200, then I know I didn't have that meeting. I was probably tired, and I just skipped the meeting, like I always do. So, <laughs> and that's it. And then at the end of it, I'm going to you know, tally up uh, how long this took, and uh, how many meetings I was able to attend, and uh, which host name I was actually on. So let me give this a try. I don't know if it's going to work the, you know, right off the bat. I hope it does. So I'm going to run this. Uh, my heart is pounding. Uh, how many people think this would just work? Wow, nobody. This is worse than my gRPC talk. All right, so I'm going to say, hey, hey, did it work? Oh, what? what? <laughs> uh, of course it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me come here, right? This always happens to me for some reason. So I'm going to say, um, am I running a proxy or something? No, no, no. You know, I changed something here um, earlier, so... I think the problem is actually here. So what happened is I, I'm getting the response, and uh, I need to write this out, blah, blah, blah. And I close the string, and that looks good. So the first one worked pretty well, <laughs> but, uh, but this one uh, didn't. So that is too bad. Now, luckily, uh, I do have a backup. So, <laughs> so let me see here. Eh, I'm different live from server. Oh, interesting. Eh, whatever. So wh what's that? What? Did somebody see uh, uh, a solution here? No? So what I'm going to do is to uh, git check out my master. Voila. Uh, stashing the changes. Git stash. Yeah, there we go. Check out master. And there we go. Now that works. <laughs> right, so I, I need to double check though. Let me just check here. Uh, maybe it was running the wrong code. Here we go. And go to work. Wait. What? 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 Huh? Internet connection. Really? Am I off again? No, 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 no. Don't tell me that's the case. No, 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 it's here. Um, let me see. I'm going to kill O cube CTO. Huh. Interesting. Am I not running this? All right. Tell you what. I'm going to go ahead and build it and see uh, if this actually works or not. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and do a Maven package. Okay. And I should just uh, package out everything. And we're going to find out pretty soon and see how Istio deals with this kind of failure. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to send this out, right? So now I have this uh, application in the, um, in the Docker containers. And I'm going to just uh, deploy it just like any other application. Uh, so potentially, I'm going to use a, uh, for example, here, work deployment uh, latest, right? So what this is going to do is to pull down this uh, container image and deploy it. And it's going to use the meeting server as the, uh, the back end here. Oh, I think I know why it didn't work. My meeting server was not working. That's why. Yeah, it's trying to make a call out, and that didn't work. That's that's exactly why. That that happens when not when you're not using a service mesh. All right. <laughs> that's 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 probably why. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, trust that this works. So with all these things, I'm going to do a kubectl apply. Dot. By the way, my Docker image in this case is using um, a JDK uh, nine, uh, sorry, GRE nine slim, and my actual service is only about three kilobytes, right? So there's nothing, not a lot thing to, to do. So, oh, I think I just deployed everything here, so that's not good. So <laughs> let me see, get pods. And I got all my services deployed, okay? And I also have an ingress. So the, what that means is I can actually get to my service, uh, hopefully, from the web. So I can do something like work. Ah, there we go. Whew, that works, yeah? But because each call is taking about... Uh, 25, uh, uh, 200, sorry, 250 milliseconds. Um, that's why this uh, took a long time. And then I actually have two versions of my work service deployed right now. So if I go back to my console, and if I find work, uh, let me do a refresh here. No, this one's gone too. Yeah, sorry. It's just like bad day today with uh, everything. Uh, there we go. So if I go to work service, you, you'll find even a worse day tomorrow in my other session. So, so here we have three versions of the work service deployed. OK, there's 1.0, 2.0, and the latest. Latest is the one I was supposedly just wrote. Uh, I guess I don't need, need that right now. So you know what? Tell you what. I'm going to just delete the latest deployment. OK, so I'm going to undeploy. So I'm going to say uh, work 
deployment uh, work server latest. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of it. But as you can see here, um, come on, get rid of it. I don't have health check, so there we go. So sometimes it goes to version two, which is when I'm working really, really hard. I go to eight meetings in a day. That's why the time is longer. And the second time is um, something I, you know, just oh, easy day and they kind of run Robin around, right? And this is something you can't expect from Kubernetes directly. But what I didn't tell you is, you know, this Kubernetes cluster is already running Istio. What that means is I can control all the traffic routing directly from the Istio control plan. And what that means is, you know, if I want to route everything to uh, version one of my service, uh, I should be able to do that. So we're going to find out pretty soon because this is not what I planned earlier, but we'll find out, right? So what that means is we can add a route rule here. And I can say this route rule applies to the destination of work server. Right? That's the one that's responding to work. And this server, I want to forward everything to just the 1.0 application. Okay. And same thing with the backend. I want to force everything to go to 1.0. To apply this route rule, I can, in this case, I can use both Kubernetes or Istio command line. I, not IO stack, no, not that one. You can use Istio command line because then you can work in different underlying infrastructure. But if you're in Kubernetes, you can just say kubectl apply this file. So I'm going to go ahead and create this rule called route to v1. Again, what's happening behind the scenes is I'm applying this desired state to Istio. It's picked up by the pilot. Pilot goes out and configures all the proxy. And uh, I'm just a little afraid to show you what this looks like. Uh, but let's see. OK. And there you go. So now, hopefully, everything is going to version 1 of the service. right? I just configured this directly from the Istio command line. You don't really have to change any configuration in your services at all. If you want to apply a retry, if, say, a backend service fails and you want to apply a retry, well, you can just apply that through a retry configuration also. So in this case, if I want to say, I want to retry for at most three times, and uh, if the connection doesn't open for two seconds, I want to close it, you can just simply by using this block, and you apply this, and you can retry. Okay. You can also apply circuit breakers as well. So let me see if I have a, one of those. So if I open up the policy for work, right? Circuit breaking is actually quite interesting because different people have different understanding of what the circuit breaker is. This is, this is new to me as well. When I think about circuit breakers, I think about Hystrix. I think about uh, detecting errors from the back end and just drop them for a few seconds before I retry them again. Right? That's, what we that's actually called, um, it can be called the outlier detection. Right? So you don't retry the bad instances until sometime later so you can retry them again. But circuit breaker in the real world behaves a little bit differently. Right? Think about in your house. What does your circuit breaker do? It's when you're overloaded, when you try to consume too much, the fuse breaks, right? And that's where the circuit breaker kind of kicks in. And in this case, Istio can do both. So not only can you do the outlier detection to say how many times the failure would mark this instance unhealthy, it can also protect you from, say, a lot of connections or DDoSing, right? So you can actually plan ahead on how, much, how many connections you should actually have, and you can enforce it by the proxy as well. Now, the other thing that's really, really awesome is actually fault tolerance testing. So in your, in your environment, whether it's staging or test, I don't recommend this for production, to be honest. You can inject faults into your application. So for example, if, you don't want, if I never want to go to another meeting anymore, I can just say 100% of the meeting call is going to return 503 status code, right? And this is cool, right? We can, you can do it less. You can say, I just don't want to work 20% of the time, right? So do whatever you want. And I can use Istio to apply it. So Istio not IO stat, uh, create F routing meeting 503. Okay, so I'm going to apply this route. Again, it went through pilot, went through a proxy configuration. Everything is applied for you automatically. And if I make this call again, you can see that we are attending no meetings. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So again, it, with this type of system, all of these concerns are abstracted away from you. You can also do, um, uh, what do you call it, um, traffic splitting if you want to. Now, the, the best thing here is that um, while I'm doing this, as you can see, this service really has nothing behind the scenes. There is just straight up JDK calls and there's nothing. However, 
I can open up a private uh, connection here. I'm going to open up my, my platform level services. So in here, I'm going to open up, what is one? Grafana, so I can see the performance of my services. Uh, in this screen, I'm going to open up uh, Prometheus, so I can query for my uh, metrics. And this one, I'm going to open up uh, Zipkin, right? This one is Zipkin, yeah. So which one do you want to see first? Let, let's see Prometheus. So Prometheus is running on my local port 9090 that's being forwarded into my Istio cluster. Okay, so what that means is I should be able to go localhost 9090. And here's Prometheus. And I can just go ahead and see, uh, let me see the request count. And you can execute. And all of those latency metrics uh, about your service is automatically stored here. Again, I didn't do anything on the client side. It's just a JDK application. I can even graph it if I want to, but this graph is not very interesting to see. What's more interesting to see is actually the um, Grafana one. So again, no extra configuration. I should be able to go to my 3000 forward my traffic into my Istio cluster. Because of the service mesh, all of the information about performance about my application, these are system level performance uh, uh, um, uh, metrics, right? This all being captured directly with Prometheus and you can visualize it in Grafana. And uh, if, if somebody makes a call, oh, there we go, there's a lot of 500 arrows. Uh, that is because I turned it upwards to almost 500%, uh, 100%, right? So you see a lot of these failure rates. Um, if I actually go and remove this rule, right? So right now I have zero things going through. Uh, let me go ahead and just remove this rule. So I can say, oh, not nah, IOS stat, I keep on doing that. Delete F, and I'm going to delete the um, 503. Okay, so now everything should going through. Yeah, voila, that's not bad. Then I can go to Zipkin, which is running on 9411. Again, I didn't do anything in my microservice, in this case, almost a nano service. I can go and query for work, and I should be able to find my trace. There we go, I could never find this button. There it is. And there it is. That is the full trace from my microservice call, right? And you can see very clearly, each call took about 250 milliseconds, and I did four of them in sequence. And you can also see the internal calls that's happening. So what's happening behind the scenes is that when this request is going through the proxy, the proxy actually has to check with the mixer about the policies and the rules and quotas for that matters. And that's why in every one of these calls, you also see a tiny, you know, almost a one millisecond call to the mixer to do the check. And if the check passes, the, re the request goes through. If the check fails, then the service match proxy will return a fault, right? So that's all pretty cool. Let me show you the one last thing here. So when I deploy my guestbook application, uh, this is also deploying into the same Istio cluster. So what that means is I can do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to go ahead and apply uh, two versions of my uh, guestbook, okay? And uh, let me just get my ingress. Now I have two versions, and I should be able to go to one of these versions like that, right? If I refresh a few times when everything's up and running, I should be able to see two versions. And if I want to inject failures, let me see here, it's still rules. Uh, for example, I can use kubectl apply in this case also to inject my Istio rules. I can say, uh, let me turn off my hello world service, for example. I'm going to say hello here. Okay. I can turn off my uh, route to v1. There we go. I'm going to route everything to v1. And then I'm going to apply another thing that kind of injects my faults. So I'm going to say uh, guestbook service, just you know, turn that off. I don't, I don't want this to show anymore. And so if I refresh it, there we go. You can see my service is gone, okay? Now what is even better, let me see if everything's up and running. I got five minutes. Yeah. Uh, we should also be able to say something like uh, routing my traffic based on not just percentages, because we can do traffic splitting. We can say 80% needs to go to V1 and let me test out 20%. Because this is an L7 proxy, what that means is we can actually introspect the headers as well. So you can actually do something special, like route all of the mobile application to a special uh, backend. Or in this case, I should say if I can route all my applications to, you know, if you're using Chrome, to version 2 of the backend. So I'm not entirely sure if my version 2 is up and running, but I'm going to try it out anyways. So I'm going to apply this rule. Again, don't modify your application. 
and do a refresh, and it's different, right? And just to prove you this is right, I'm going to open Safari, and I'm going to go to the same app, and I see a different thing, OK? So that is really, really easy to do. Uh, if you want to give it a try, we actually have a lab outside. You can actually you know, be hands-on with this. And uh, hopefully, you do see the value of potentially you know, dealing with the cross-cutting concerns uh, directly through the mesh rather than within your own application. Now, that being said, um, you know, I'm just going to close this out. Here's a, a little idea of how this um, Mitchell TLS work. We can actually run a certificate uh, authority within the cluster, and that will actually be able to uh, exchange the certificate using a new protocol called Spiffy, and we can give the certificate to each of the proxies so they can actually identify themselves and establish a Mutual TLS. Okay? So just remember, uh, with the service mesh, the key here is that you let the, uh, the service operators right, being able to deal with cross cutting concern a lot easier. You can do traffic controls. You can do traffic splitting. Uh, and deals with all the resiliencies that you otherwise need to build into your own app. At the high level, I have to say, it still currently is at 0 0.2. It is better than 0 0.1. Twice as good, right? But but uh, it is not exactly production ready yet, right? And they should have a new version by 0 0.3 and 1.0 hopefully uh, next year, right? And by that time, what they want to do is to be able to run Istio, not just in Kubernetes, but also in other environments, OK? And uh, you can get started pretty easily, but they just go to the back. And uh, we have a, a, work, um, a collab area outside. There's actually an Istio lab that you can take which is really, really cool. And the reason I'm here today is so that hopefully you have some interest to give this a try. And secondly, you know, participate in the community. We have a lot of community interest and participation, but I want you to give it a try as well. Uh, the best way is to find out some mailing list or um, file issue on GitHub. And uh, you can find all of the example that actually works on my GitHub and try to collab outside. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Any questions? Got three minutes left. Yeah, question in the back. What about the internal locking operation for the microservices? Right. So this does not have the internal tracing of the microservices in, within the application. So for that, you need to capture potentially the trace ID and then apply your own tracer if you really, really want to do it. Right. And that depends, because you can also potentially get away with a profiler sometimes. So you have to pick and choose what you want to use. Yeah. But in my example, in my Spring application, I was able to add a HTTP span extractor. So behind the scenes, I can still use Sleuth. I'm still using Spring Cloud Sleuth. I can capture the request ID, and I can use the same request ID to do internal tracing and still forwarding it to, to Zipkin, potentially. Yeah. yeah. Question in the front? Uh, if you are not using Kubernetes, but you're using VMs? No. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you sure can. You can install Instio today on uh, many different clusters. Uh, what I do recommend is by using uh, uh, Kubernetes 1.7 plus uh, with the feature called initializer. And that will give you a very transparent way to attach pro uh, Istio proxies to your application. You don't have to do this explicitly. It just happens automatically. But yes, it should work with uh, different um, Kubernetes installation, including on-prem. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Yeah, one in the back. What's the memory over for the proxy? That's a very good question. Uh, I don't have the number right now, but uh, I will definitely find out. Yeah. Thank you. No? All right. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.